the reason after this is my 42nd year as a martial artist, the reason that you can stick me on the floor with a, a rambunctious four-year-old or, you know, put me with a world-class martial art athlete and I'm equally as happy is when I'm teaching, I'm, I'm looking at the bigger picture of the benefits that they're receiving. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned into Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Chris Raffold. We're going to have a great chat. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. And so stick around. If you're new to the show, please head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Show notes, transcripts, all that good stuff, stuff that you would expect, stuff that you wouldn't expect. And if you're not checking out what we have there, you're missing out. If you're not checking out what we have at whistlekick.com, you're definitely missing out because what we do here to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial arts of the world is a lot more than this show. We have events. We have apparel. I mean, this shirt's, you know, retired, but, you know, we do stuff like that. And it's all because we believe as an organization that six months of martial arts training can change someone's life. And what if we get everybody to do that? We can change the world. So if that resonates for you, help us in our mission. Chris, thank you for helping us in our mission by being here. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. And, you know, that, that little bit that you did is quite an introduction. And I, uh, I applaud your, your thought process as far as six months of martial arts. Uh, I think that's so... How many times have you heard that, though? Somebody comes up to you, they find out that you teach, you train, you coach... And they say, you know, I did six months of whatever when I was a kid, and I know it made such an impact on me. I want my kid to do karate, taekwondo, whatever. Yeah, it uh, it happens frequently. It happens often. I will uh, maybe one up that or just validate that, uh, which is now doing this going into my thirty third year. I have my students now bringing their children. You know, they grew up in my school and now they're bringing their children and there's never a greater validation of, of what it is that we do than when somebody says, I want my son, I want my daughter to experience the same thing, to hear the same lessons, to, to go through the same, you know, victories and struggles that I did because it helped to mold my character and this is what I want to provide them to get them ready for whatever life holds for them. Yeah. That, that is the best kind of one-upsmanship, right? Like that is such a <laughs> powerful thing. And, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I haven't been teaching long enough to have that experience, but I've talked to people who have worked with two, three, even four generations in a family. Sure. And it doesn't seem to be, that there's anything they take more pride in, you know? Yeah. yeah. Competitive success of students is great. Yeah. Advancing students to certain ranks is great. But when someone pays you that ultimate compliment of you changed my life in this way, this sure. limited time my child has, I mm -hmm. want to, them to spend some of it with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really powerful. And, you know, when you look at all of the different events and activities, there are, there's so few that generations can do together. Um, speaking from my, uh, you know, my own family, my, um, uh, my mom, my uh, ex-wife, my uh, children, my nieces, my nephews, you know, everybody in my family has somehow, some way been connected, um, you know, in, in martial arts and, it's, you know, it's, it creates such a bond and, you know, you're going to look back and we're going to all have memories of our, our life. And, uh, to be able to say, you know, you got to spend, you know, hundreds or thousands of hours on the map with my grandmother or my mother or my father, um, you know, my brother, sister, it's, that's, that's the stuff that money can't buy. You know, it's, it's, it's precious. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the most successful martial arts schools I've seen embrace that 
and have like a family style class. I don't know if you do that. It's something that, that we do in my school. And I've seen schools that it's the heart of what they do. Yeah. And it's so yeah. powerful to watch. Mm -hmm. It is. It, you know, I was talking to my uh, team the other day and, and I said, I have long since um, become bored with teaching our first form, which is Chunji. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, years ago. I mean, I've taught it tens of thousands of times and I, I'm bored of teaching it. Yes. That's all I was. So I could get you to tune out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Look at you. You're doing the arm movements. You know the form. Uh -huh. I know. Downward block punch, downward block punch, you know. But the reason after this is my 42nd year as a martial artist, the reason that you can stick me on the floor with a, a rambunctious four-year-old or, you know, put me with a world-class martial art athlete and I'm equally as happy is when I'm teaching, I'm, I'm looking at the bigger picture of the benefits that they're receiving. I'm looking at just the postural change that they're making, uh, you know, with their, with their shoulders. I'm looking at the confidence that they have mm -hmm. to take on to be successful at the particular move. Uh, I'm looking at them breaking down their fears or facing their fears head on using, you know, uh, you know, gentle progressive resistance to get them to the point that you can go full force and it's not a big deal to them. If it was purely a physical, I'm teaching a physical memorized pattern and that was it. I would have been out of it a long time ago because I would have been so bored. But now, you know, 33 years later as a teacher, I just, I'm as happy today uh, teaching and seeing what our program does for people as I, as I was that very first class that I taught with one boy who enrolled in my program. And I, I remember him and, and as excited as I was to, open personal best and teach him. I'm that excited when I walk on the floor. Yeah. How did you end up starting your school? Was it, was it something you'd always wanted to do or mm. did circumstances create that? Well, uh, I think we were both lucky in that we were able to turn what was a, a started out as a hobby into a career. Mm. I went to college and I graduated with a degree in exercise physiology. And Where did you go? Uh, uh, Bridgewater State University. Mm -hmm. Well, it was Bridgewater State College at the time, but university now. And I, uh, with, I graduated in May, and then in July I opened Personal Best with absolutely to say. I didn't know what I was doing. I would say I was below zero if that's possible. <laughs> so I knew how to, I knew karate and uh, I had absolutely no business background whatsoever. Uh, knew nothing about a, a professional, you know, how to run a professional school. I just had my mind set on, you know, if I could, you know, based on the rent that I was paying, which I think was $900 at the time, if I, okay, if I can get like 12 students, I got my rent covered. And if I, you know, could ever get up to 40 or 50 students, I'd be set for life. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, yeah. this is living large. Um, where you know, where was it, your school? It, uh, well, my, my schools have always been about, about 45 minutes south of Boston, okay. about 20 minutes, 25 minutes north of Providence. So we were in that little corridor between the two of them. And the first school was in Easton, E-A-S-T-O-N, mm -hmm. Mass. And, uh, yeah, it, you know, that's that's how it started. It was just, hey, let's, you know, I want to do this and and um, just open the doors and, and, and that was it. And then through the good graces of a lot of, people and God and, uh, you know, probably a lot of, you know, just fortune that I don't even recognize. I was able to, um, 
I was able to get around people that knew a lot more about what I didn't know than I did at the time. And I just started to, you know, mentor with them. And it made made such a difference. The other, you know, the other thing, too, is, and I don't think this can be understated, I had the sliver of time where I was coming in after the Karate Kid. I was coming in around the time of the Ninja Turtles and the Power Rangers. So at the time, there was an explosion uh, like nothing we had ever seen. It was 1991, so late 80s, you know, I think started the explosion, but it was still, you know, it was still quite, you know, I, I had good fortune. I had the, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of like if you buy a stock and the whole market is going up, you think you're a genius <laughs> and you don't realize True story. You're, you're just, you're just being carried, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, so I think I have to acknowledge that in fairness, but um, for whatever the reason it was, uh, it turned out to be good. Mm. So you open that day in, uh -huh. in July, and for and for those of you, because I've learned there's there are regional differences with this. For those of you who don't know, uh, starting something that is even at least partially focused on children in New England in July isn't isn't necessarily a great choice. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but there but there you are. You're doing it. You've got this this one boy that shows up. And, and then what? Yeah. Did it grow I, quickly? You know, or did you struggle? Well, I was, <clears throat> I was living at my friend's house and I was cleaning. Uh, I was living at my friend's mother's house, I should say. And I was cleaning the house in exchange for rent. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my overhead was extremely low and I was very, you know, grateful for that. Um, I opened the school with $700 in the bank. So I, and my rent was $900 though. I want to say I might've had a month or two of free rent. So, you know, okay. the time clock was ticking. Um, but, uh, and also at the time, not knowing anything, we had a supermarket across a street from our school. So I spent my time littering their parking lot <laughs> with uh, flyers that I would put. Again, this is, you know, 33 years ago. Uh, I would put them on the windshields of cars. Because uh, you could do that back then. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, to, uh, to say that now, I almost feel embarrassed because it sounds offensive. You know, you just, at least in this area of the world, you just don't do that. Um, but at the time, you know, uh, there was myself and there were other businesses that were doing that. And that was mm -hmm. that was OK, which was fortunate because I didn't have an advertising budget. But I took advantage of what was around me, which was, you know, a supermarket that had pulled a lot of people uh, close to my school. And um, yeah, and I have to say it, it did grow. And, you know, I remember, you know, back then, if I placed an ad, you know, we would get seven calls, uh, you know, we would up to 14 calls, you know, for placing an ad, which is why I say I, I had some luck on my side coming off of the Karate Kid, because that's not the reality anymore. Uh, at least not not in my world. It's not, um, you know, so again, good fortune. And, uh, you know, the other thing that I would say is, you know, we always have we have two things two polar opposites that we all have in life. And that is the good fortune of, of having people to show you what to do and the good fortune of people to show you what not to do. So I had come from a, a very competitive martial arts school. And, you know, at the time, I don't think, you know, my teacher emotionally was in a very good place in his life. So I remember all of the things that he did that I didn't like, and I just did the opposite. And people seemed to really like and enjoy it. <laughs> so he had a uh, he had a hand in helping me, uh, you know, just through his his poor example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was it was a combination of doing that, and then I 
you know, I would, I would uh, give a nod to my upbringing as well. Uh, you know, I was taught right from wrong and I was, <clears throat> I was taught to be a, you know, I would hope a thoughtful, caring, kind person. I think I've always naturally gravitated to being an, to being an energy giver. So I combine those things with my love of physical martial arts at the time. And then it was the exposure to other people that were talking about all of the additional benefits somebody could gain from uh, the, you know, a lifestyle of martial arts as opposed to, you know, simply a competitive outlet. Mm. And, uh, and that was, you know, very rewarding. And that was my, my, um, excitement and my enthusiasm started to almost, almost, you know, rise to the level of equaling that same level of excitement I had for, you know, competitiveness. Hmm. Yeah. What were some of the, if, if I'd watched your school in the early years, what were some of those adjustments that maybe happened as you embraced that side of training and living a, a martial arts lifestyle? I think I had um, I had started to weave in from a very early on, uh, probably not quite from the beginning, but early on taking the sayings, taking the <clears throat> mindset of the personal development side of thinking and combining it in the form of, you know, writing, writing quotes on a whiteboard or talking to people about the importance of, you know, eating healthy and, you know, saying great instead of good and creating self-discipline habits of, you know, fixing your bed. Uh, fixing, you know, fixing your bed was the first thing that I started with. You know, we all know it's easy to do, it's easy not to do. Um, and... You know, it just, it was an interesting metaphor for me to prove to a parent that, again, this is going back a long time, but the, what I could potentially bring their child outside of just a physical outlet, but I, I could actually influence them by uh, uh, assigning them the task of fixing their bed and the parents were amazed that they would actually follow through. And you and I both know, you know, sometimes you can say the same thing a parent says, uh, but, yeah. you know, because of the, the familiarity a child has with a parent, you know, sometimes it just goes right in one ear and out the other. But when yeah. somebody on the outside validates um, a habit, a thought process, that a parent has been saying, all of a sudden it clicks and, um, you know, bringing a, 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 a report card uh, that you're not proud of to your parent is one thing, bringing it to your martial art instructor, <laughs> well, that's a whole nother thing, mm. you know, so um, it was those things early on that I started to weave in from the knowledge base that I had from the personal development that I had been exposed to, that I started to bring in and craft into the program. Mm -hmm. And now that's, you know, I'd like to say that's more commonplace uh, in in it the is, martial I'd arts say. world. I think there's there's, you know, as I've as I've traveled around and had the privilege of going into probably hundreds of martial arts schools now. I've seen it, you know, it's on a continuum. Some people are magical at delivering the message and, and some people, you know, they make the attempt, which is good, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, there's, there might be a couple, couple things missing for it to really have the impact uh, that it could have, but, you know, I applaud them for making the effort. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, Kind of, kind of going back to how we open this idea that, that martial arts has such substantial benefits that a child is going to remember those, right? If it was just the physical stuff, if it was just the punching and the kicking, 
kids going to think about it in terms of fun. Right. They're going to look back and say, you know, it, it got me moving. Um, you know, we're old enough now that nobody was really concerned about kids needing to get up off the couch and move. Right. You know, it's something right. we talk about with, with today's youth. But we're going to think about it in the same way that we, we might think about football or soccer or baseball. So so having those other elements in there. It's, it's almost like you can't help but find that personal growth because of the the process that we use, that constant, you know, you're, you're never done. Right. Right. You, you've taught Chungji, we'll say, tens of thousands of times, maybe a hundred thousand times. Probably. And if we were to describe that action outside of martial arts, everyone would agree you are expert level perfect. But I bet if you watched you teaching Chung Ji on a video from yesterday, you would say, I could do that a little better. Oh, you know, I oh didn't mention goodness. that. Or, <laughs> oh, you know what? I can see where the students are not understanding their attention's drifting, right? There's always something to improve within what we do. And I think that it's that very nature that makes what we do so special and so different. Well, I think, you know, on that point, I agree with you because I look at um, in, in the sport of sport karate, which I come from, the difference between first and second or first and fourth could be a, a half a second, right? It's a very, it's a very subjective sport. It's who hits who hardest and first and, and what judge has the particular angle to be able to see the effectiveness. Uh, you know, there's, there's all of those things. So there's a level of, you know, right, wrong or indifferent There's a level of perfection that has to be applied and um, we're always looking for that one little advantage to really, you know, solidify consistency over time in that sport. Um, I bring the same level of passion to teaching. And I think the, the teachers that I have modeled, uh, and I'll use, I'll use Chris's words uh, to describe what I see is the teachers that I admire the most. They have an ability to meet a student where they're at, number one. So they're, they're not going to force feed what they're good at to a student that doesn't have the physical ability or mental maturity to be able to handle that yet. So wherever they're at, three years, four years, five years, uh, physical, uh, mental disabilities, um, injuries, you know, age, you know, et cetera. They're going to a PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, you know, all of these things that it's just commonplace for us to come face to face with every day. These teachers are going to meet them where they're at. They're going to gain a level of trust and rapport with that student. But you first have to, you have to know how to go there and you know, you have to know how to unlock that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure you could, I'm not sure you could uh, read a book on it or say, okay, well, to create rapport with people, do step one, step two, step three. Well, that will work for that that middle section of the yeah. world, but the people on the outer extremes, and I would argue the people that really need, need, need something like martial arts, you have to have that gift. So we meet them where they're at, and then from there, at a pace that they can handle, and that's where we provide, you know, we use the term progressive resistance. We start as their confidence builds physically and mentally, we start to gradually bring them up to a level of proficiency that will work against, you know, a resisting opponent or, mm. or, or work against a level of 
work against a level of mental resistance that they're going to have in life. They're going to need to understand how to deal with uh, somebody not loving them the way their mom and dad does, or they're going to need to learn how to deal with a defeat on the basketball team or or whatever. And it's I think it goes back to being able to meet them where they're at, adding that level of progressive resistance and, and building their confidence over time. I believe in a transfer effect. I don't, I think if you can show someone success in a particular discipline, and the one we're talking about right now is martial arts, and if you can show them how to, how to take themselves from where they are by by coming alongside them hmm. and showing them how they can earn a level of proficiency, you're teaching them a whole lot more than martial arts because you're showing them how to approach anything. Yeah. As, as you're probably aware, uh, sometimes we see people, and, and we just have to be careful of this. We have to be careful of this as martial artists. I think we have to be careful of this as friends. I think we have to be careful of this as parents. But to use a martial art metaphor, because you award somebody a stripe on their belt or a belt, and you say that is what's building the child's confidence, that's lunacy. Mm -hmm. The only power the belt has is the intelligence of the person receiving the belt knowing what they did to earn the belt so if you try to shortcut and you look at the belt hierarchy and you say ah this is a way to retain and motivate my students is i'm going to give them tips and belts mm -hmm. you're missing the whole point of it uh the analogy I don't know, Jeremy, what would be the analogy of a parent trying to shortcut uh, that? It's like giving a, a child free access to a credit card or something I like think, that. I was thinking something around, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, or, or, okay, or, uh, how is that going to, okay, so you gave them the reward of free access to your credit card, but they never understood the value of money. They never understood the responsibility of earning. They've never had the lesson of the responsibility of saving, of prioritizing where they're going to allocate their money. So giving them the gift does not, it, it, you know, it's not, you put two children side by side, one that had to go through the lessons to get the credit card, and then one that was given a credit card. It's it's just not the same thing. Yeah. I believe a lot of the challenges we have right now in the world, we have parents having children, and many of those parents were raised in a way where they did not get to connect effort with results. Yes. I mean, that's everything I'm hearing you talk about. And if, if you, if you, not that a lot of the, the, the truly wealthy, you know, the multi-billionaires talk a lot about their children and how they're raising their children. But if you look at some of them, the ones that are able to, like I'm thinking of Grant Cardone, he's very public about how he's raising his kids and what they get, what they have access to, what they have to do for it. Shaquille O'Neal, the same thing. He talks about, you know, yeah, I have a lot of money, but you don't have a lot of money and I'm going to make sure that I'm not just going to give you this money because that's the worst thing I can do for you as a parent. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think it is. And, and in one scenario, it's, it's done out, you know, let's, let's hope it's done out of a desire to want to retain somebody so sure. that you can have the impact that you hope to have on them one day. Or in the other situation with a parent, uh, it's done for the right reasons, i.e., I love my child. I want to give them what I never had the opportunity to have. Which is but a logical desire. Logical. Right? We totally all want our logical. kids to have better lives than we had. Yep. 
Yep, yep. But we have to we have to temper that. We really do. And and it's uh it's not easy. It's a balance and act for sure. But being mindful and aware of those things, I think in either case, when you give somebody something that they don't deserve, you actually I think, and I'll use a strong word, but I think over time, uh, I would certainly say the word's appropriate, you cripple them. And I really, I feel, I feel very strongly about that being done consistently over time. You cripple them. Uh, It creates a a level of entitlement Mm -hmm. and it diminishes their want and their desire to create habits for themselves and that's a scary it's a scary road to go down on now I'll I'm going to preface this with something else that that almost sounds contradictory um, this past week we had a uh, a tournament an inner school tournament uh, with our four schools we brought them together and it was a sparring tournament now Here's where I do something that people would say, ha ha, you're not practicing what you're preaching. <clears throat> Every single student that competed in that tournament, whether they, <clears throat> whether they lost their first match or they took first place, they received a medal. They received an acknowledgement. Now, there's a there's a very strong stance out there that what well, you know we're raising kids everybody gets a trophy everybody's a winner. I think it comes down to the motive and I think it comes down to the explanation given for why the result yes. is given. When a child is six years old, nine years old, when a when a student is forty three years old and they've never competed in their life. And they've been really working hard and they muster up the courage to say, you know what, I'm nervous about it, but I'll go in and I'm going to, I want to try it. I'm going to, I'm going to compete. I think that that medal to that person is an acknowledgement like good for you. You know what? Mm -hmm. You stepped up, you put yourself out there and uh, you did it. Now, what did what did you do right? What did you do wrong? Well, let's go back to the lab and let's work on it. So the idea of everyone getting a medal is the acknowledgement of that. It's not done out of any way, shape, or form like I wanna I wanna hide the fact that somebody's incompetent, but I don't I I wanna keep that incompetence as a secret. No, 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 no. It has nothing it's 800 miles away from that. I'm and hearing it's a completely different culture. It, oh, it's okay. I imagine yeah. if I, if I observe that event, right. Cause, cause what you're talking about, what, what I, I think some, some schools, some events will do is, you know, they'll award first through fourth and then fifth and so on receive something. So they don't cry. Right. That's not what I'm hearing from you. I'm hearing right. that the priority is not, on winning first place, the priority is on maybe participation or maybe education, learning, et cetera. And the, the, the winning, so to speak, is a, is a secondary consequence. Absolutely. And, and by the way, my friend, let me, it's, it's uh, serendipitous that, that this thought just popped into my head, but uh, you said crying. Um, in 1991, again, I opened my school in July, and I was working at a uh, a women's online clothing store. Before there was online, it was like in a 1991. Catalog. Yes, right. <laughs> okay. I, I opened I opened my wow. school with with you know seven hundred dollars in the bank, and my rent was right. nine hundred. Well, I, I so. figured there was a job <laughs> in there somewhere. I just didn't imagine it would be online women's clothing. <clears throat> Keep going. Yeah, I'd say so. It was called Chadwick's of Boston. I don't know if it's still around, but what they did is they sent out catalogs. Uh, I'm I'm circling around to get to the point on this. I hope I don't lose it in the the woman's clothing. But we would literally get, you know, I had to go through about a week's worth of training, 
And literally, we would get calls from women all over the world. And, you know, I'd like to buy, you know, this dress on page 23. And you'd set up shipping and it would go out. And so I was just like a, I never made outbound calls. I just sat there and I read Unlimited Power Tony Robbins until the phone rang. And then I would answer the phone with my headset on and voila. So anyways, in October... I ended up getting fired from that job because I had, I had asked my supervisor in July uh, when I took the job, I said in October, I'm going to London to compete for the world championships. So I'm going to be out of the country for a week off. And she said, no, no, appreciate the notice. And, you know, no problem. Well, in the process of it, uh, my uh, supervisor ended up getting moved or relocated or left the company or whatever. And the supervisor said, Hey, Chris, good luck. But if you're leaving for a week, um, you're done. Mm. So I politely said, well, I think you can understand (laughs) it's, but so I tell you all of that, that that background story to tell you this, I competed at the world championships and I was down by two points with about five seconds to go. And, Best of five? Uh, no, this was a two-round match. Okay. Uh-huh. So I was down by two points. And the only thing that I could do to win it would be I would have to jump kick to the head. And um, so I ended up, you know, taking a Hail Mary and jumping up and hitting this person with a flying axe kick, like a jump axe kick. And when I did it, he turned away and, uh, you know, kind of took cover from it. Instead of awarding me the point, they gave him a warning and time expired. So if you look at me up taking second place in the world, uh, you'll see me biting my lip because I can assure you there were tears. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was probably, you know, up until that point, certainly as a competitor, that was the saddest moment of my life, winning the silver medal. So does it really... so close. my, My point in all of that is, does it really matter if the person is crying because it's second place or the person is crying because they were a finalist? Here's the thing. I had a lesson. I had a lesson I had to learn. I, I, you know what? I never should have let it get that close. That one's on me. Mm. I, you know, I could, I could have left the sport and said, you know what? The judges are unfair or they just wanted this person to win or, you know, I could have done all of the justifications in the world. The reality is I had a lesson to learn. So now take it back to the, inner school event, Uh, you know, everyone is getting a medal and they understand why they're getting a medal and it's explained to them. And then the instructors are following up with them this week and, you know, talking about it and what did you do and what did you think you did well and all of that. And, you know, how somebody feels and the fact that there are tears let me tell you something, and, and as you well know, as, a, as being a martial artist, some of the greatest learning lessons we have in martial arts comes out of failure. So failure is not a bad thing. Failure is, the word failure, I think, is just an extreme level of feedback. It's an extreme level of emotional feedback that we feel. <clears throat> so it's not something we need to be afraid of. I would rather a seven-year-old cry because he took second or he was a finalist than him not have that experience and then him be 37 years old and not know how to handle, you know, getting laid off or missing a promotion or something like that. That, to me, that's the crippling part of it. So allow these experiences it, allow them to come. It's 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 wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Human beings learn by making mistakes. 
right? And one of the things that I'll talk about sometimes when I'm giving a seminar, because uh, because most of the work that I do is around how people learn martial arts, right? And just I believe there's a lot of instinct that we ignore, and, and you know, so we tend to do a lot of slower movement. And one of the, the kind of metaphors that I'll bring in is is a baby learning how to walk. How does that baby learn how to walk? By falling down a lot. Yeah. I've never heard anyone say, you're a stupid baby, you should give up walking. Right. right? We know inherently that this is how we learn things. And I, and I love the way that you put it. You, know, you should have never let it get that close. You took the ownership on yourself. How can I improve the situation for next time? Now, right. I, I used to compete. I had plenty of those situations. And I'm really thankful that, you know, because I, I was I was competing in the mid 90s as a, a, a hyper traditional forms practitioner and competing in a circuit that seemed to reward more dynamic action. Mm -hmm. of and course. my mother, you know, my mother was my coach and, and we had plenty of conversation about it. And she said, look, you just need to be so much better that there's no question. And that's yeah. what I did. <laughs> and right. so we went back to, you know, I'm going to use your metaphor because I like it, of the lab. We went back to the lab. How do I make this better? As I got to know judges, how can I make this better? How can I make this better? Do you remember right. the last time I did it? You told me to do this thing. Did I do that thing? And just pulling everybody in and figuring out how to do that. Yeah. And that is the approach I've brought to, to everything for the rest of my life. That's, you know, when people, you know, point to, to the successes that we've had here as an organization, it's not because I'm good at any of the things that we've, that we do. It's because I just didn't stop doing them. Right. Right. Isn't it funny that you and I, and the people that we admire, um, where, where we are and they're where they are, you know, above us, because they've allowed themselves to fail more than we've currently failed. Yeah. And, you know, when you turn that on its head and you, you fully embrace the truth of that, then it puts a totally different spin on what's, what's our responsibility today? Because, and I'll be honest, you know, listen, listen to what I say, don't watch me too close, you know, that type of thing. Um, do I, uh, you know, come to the end of the day sometimes and I'm like, oh, I just, I, you know, couldn't get out of my own way or I wanted to finish that project and I could, and I, I'm experiencing the failure. <clears throat> and sometimes I define my day by, did I complete it or did I not complete it? So sure, sure. I, there's a very, I think we all have that. Yeah, there's a very, there's a very, Yes, yes, yes. The but. The but is a big thing. I don't know if I told you the last time we spoke, but, you know, for what it's worth, I, I, I share this because it's been such a profound lesson in my life. Uh, one of my teachers and the person that I would probably give the most credit to from a, a competitive standpoint that I got to mentor under was Billy Blanks the gentleman that's more famous now for Taibo, but in the, in his day, he was, you know, uh, just, you know, top in Dominant. the world and yeah, in sport karate. And we were at the school, uh, one time and myself and a couple others, we were in the back room and we were talking about, um, you know, the, our experience, this past weekend with a tournament that we went to and we were talking about how the judges were against us and the crowd was doing this and this person was biased and that, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, we were just venting <clears throat> and he overheard us and he said, he came over to us and, and uh, you know, Billy is quite an imposing figure and I was 15 or 16 at the time. And he said to all of us, he said, you have to be so good that they can't take it from you. And until you're that good, just shut up and train. And I don't even know if he was that eloquent, but the message was received. And I cannot tell you, thank God, 
he came in and interrupted. He sent a <clears throat> an electrical volt, <laughs> unlike anything that I had ever felt through my nervous system. And <clears throat> whether since that day or in addition to the lessons that I received from my mom and and other people in my life that have been great influences on me, whenever I feel like I'm making an excuse, it's like I feel that electrical volt of shut up. It, you know, I'm using the word shut up to just kind of interrupt my yeah. mental thought, like shut up you, you until you're that good. You need to work your craft. You're obviously not good enough and that's okay. And by the way, that's okay. That's okay. You're you're where you're at, and that's where you're at. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. good or bad. It's just it's just where you're at. You know? One of the things you know, we've we've talked today and even pointed at it a short time ago. This idea that martial arts is never done, right? That there's always more. There's always better. You're never perfect. Sure. Right. And I think we have to be really careful. And this is something I'm I'm spending a lot of time on right now. That if you set yourself up in a format where the desire is to continue to improve, you have to find a way to celebrate successes along the way, to be proud of yourself, to be happy. Because if you hinge happiness on perfection and perfection does not exist, yeah. you leave yourself trapped. Right. And it, it, you know, and that's something that, uh, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm 45 and I'm able to articulate that now. I'm not yeah. living it yet, but I see it. I see what needs to change in my life. And I know I bring that up because I know I'm not the only one. And I hear, you know, maybe a bit of that, but, you know, with, with more experience and um, more self, uh, more grace that you're giving yourself. And I want the audience to understand that, that, yeah, chase, chase, the, chase the rainbows. But you, you've, you've got to take moments and be proud and be thankful and grateful and happy. Right. And let me say, you look damn good for 45. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, trying. And, I'm trying. Yes. And, and also, too, <clears throat> as far as, you know, perfection. Um, I, I, it's not worth chasing, uh, I don't think, because it's just so unattainable. Uh, Simone Biles, yesterday, um, you know, she's, she, they have named... Um, now, two moves in her honor, because nobody on the planet Earth has ever done them before. Yesterday, she did the second move in a more difficult fashion. So now she is the... I'm laughing because I watched it and it's just... Okay. It's like... It's... <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to describe how ridiculously good she is. Like her... People argue about uh, in basketball, you know, Michael Jordan or Kobe or LeBron. There's right, no right. argument in women's gymnastics. <laughs> it's crazy. It's it's insane. But um, you know, even even with somebody that is so far above every other human being on earth, she's still perfecting her art. So. If Simone Biles cannot hit perfection because she continues to one up her perfection, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> you know. That's a good now, point. now that being said, what I what I would offer is a suggestion that I'm sharing to remind myself and and also listeners if this resonates with them. Sometimes. You know, we say, well, you know, I'm training and, you know, how long have you been training? I've been, you know, training for, you know, put the number of years on it. It doesn't really matter. I do find, at least with myself, I want to set a tangible goal that I'm going after. Perfection is not going to be it. So, for example, for this year, um, I've devoted 2024 in addition to the things that I'm doing is I'm actually working on the symmetry of my physique mm. and I'm working on my weight and I'm working on my body composition. 
Now, all of these things have measurements associated with it. And I've sought out a coach that mm -hmm. is a professional in this area. And, and why am I doing that? Because what I want to do is I want to be able to be chasing after something. When I, when I set those goals, it creates intention in my work. At least for myself, I'm not good at just going to classes and logging attendance, you know, in my jujitsu or my Muay Thai or something like that. Because without the intentionality around a goal, I'll kind of slide along laterally. I'll bring a half level, a three quarter level, whatever of focus to that class. And, you know, one, one could argue from the outside, am I getting better or am I kind of plateauing? Now, the goal does not have to be competition. The goal might be, you know, the execution of a movement. The goal might be, you know, I want to feel more comfortable when, when, when somebody has me in this position. I want to feel more comfortable escaping that because when anybody gets... When anybody uh, making up, when somebody takes my back, I just feel so vulnerable, like I don't know what to do. Or when somebody throws a switch kick at me, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, not responding correctly. Create a tangible goal and continue to work on that goal until you achieve it. And then set the next tangible goal. So some of them can be against a technique. It can, it can be against a position. Uh, you know, and then there are other goals that, you know, can, you know, take a little bit longer, like a, like the, the physique goal that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm working on for 2024. But when a martial artist adds a level of tangibility, I think it just, it, it just improves the level of intentionality that they bring to their practice and they bring to their week. You know, the one thing that competition always did for me, it kept me walking the straight and the narrow. Yeah. Because if I was ducking my workout, that's fine. You know, maybe my instructor didn't know. Maybe my classmates didn't notice. But I would get beat up on the weekends. And I could only point the finger at myself. So... I, I like to, so my, my equation of that not competing anymore is I like to create, I like to force my hand of self-discipline and that for me is setting the tangible goals. So. Awesome. I, I'm big on goal setting, you know, and, yeah. and I suspect that you, you have a hard time encourage as, as I do getting people to see the value in goals because they're so afraid of not meeting them. Right. Right. One right. of the things, and, and I'm, I'm not going to call them out by name, but I am going to call out my team because not all of them are, would take, take my, my push. When I tell them like, let's set, let's set a goal. We all, you know, all the divisions of whistle pick have goals for 2024. There are certain things that, you know, that they have put down on paper and, getting all any of them to set those goals early in the year was really tough. And yeah. I could see it in their eyes. Some of them even said it, but what if I don't, yeah. you can't look at it that way. Right. 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 And, and, yep. and, and, you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you what my goal last year was. It was that whistle kick was going to be profitable. And when I set that in January, 2023, I had no idea how we were going to get there because right. it had been nine years of us not getting there. Yeah. Well, we did yes. it. Nice. And it wasn't until halfway through the year that I figured out what the thing was that was going to get us there. And we've right. got bigger goals for this year and we'll continue to have bigger goals because just as you're talking about, you, you've got to have, you've got to have that reason. And I think the longer that we train, the longer that, we, that our life looks, at least from the outside, very similar day after day, week, month, year after year, the more you need those goals to shake things up and get you uncomfortable because growth doesn't come from comfort. Growth comes from discomfort. Yes, uh, without question, without question. Well said, my friend. And I think you brought up a, a point that there is a, there is a, <clears throat> there is a, 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 fl a, a floppy muscle that a lot of us have when it comes to setting goals. 
You know, anything that we want to do, you know, I, I kind of liken it to a muscle. You got a self-discipline muscle. You got a self-control muscle. You got a confidence muscle. Um, and I think the knee-jerk reaction is, um, what if I miss it? If I don't set the goal, well, nobody can really hold me accountable. And you know, it's it 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 creates a, a scenario where I'm assured that I won't feel the pain. The the challenge is you're not going to grow as a result of that. So for for my friends, and in full disclosure, there are things that I'm really good at setting goals about, and then there are things that I'm like a white belt at setting goals about. So when I feel that white belt insecurity come over me as it pertains to goal setting, I'm going to take that goal that I'm afraid to set or I'm setting it, but I'm like, I don't even believe it. And I'm going to take it from a year down to six months, down to a quarter, you know, down to a month, down to two weeks, down to a week. And if I have to bring it all the way down to, okay, listen, I can spend, you know, a half hour twice a week on this goal then all I'm going to do is hold myself accountable for investing 60 minutes a week because I can believe that. So I think kind of like the progressive resistance when we're teaching martial arts is I think about goal setting. That's my version of I have to be able to meet myself where I'm at as it pertains to this goal. In the lowest place I can go will be can I get myself to invest and commit to this amount of time? And then if I can do that and I can develop that habit, okay, I got that habit and I'm gaining proficiency because you can't help it if you bring in some intentionality to that half hour. Okay, what's the next thing that I can do and, you know, kind of take it from there? Yeah, it's it, it, something it we're all working like... on. I'm, lo- I'm looking to see I was going to use a visual to, to pose this next thing, but uh, I, I'm hearing in your words, I suspect that you continue to uh, respect a gentleman that you've already mentioned. And you, the quote that came to mind from him is when I think that I can't, I must. Uh, yeah. Right. And that's, and that, and that's a Tony Robbins quote. And it's sure. something that I embrace wholeheartedly. You know, I don't, I, that's my trigger. When yeah. I feel that, that, okay, I've got to find a way to do this yes. because that there's, there's that appropriate level of discomfort, not I'm terrified, right. not I'm going to die. But when I realize this action makes me super nervous, right? right. Which is what, Hey, school owners, just about every single white belt that steps over your threshold feels that and beyond day one, right? So, so if you're not doing things that make you feel uncomfortable, it can be really difficult to relate to them and remember what it feels like. Right. Yeah. But setting, setting those goals and and breaking those things down, it's what we do in our training. It's what we do in martial arts curriculum. You keep showing up, you keep putting in the time and the energy, you keep looking for those incremental progresses, celebrating the wins. And eventually you look back and go, Oh, I'm kind of good at this. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah, and somebody pays you a compliment and you're like, what? <laughs> because they haven't been there on the journey. And it's to you because you've been in it. It's not even a big deal because you're forgetting what you felt like in the beginning, right? Uh, we we have a, um, a little acronym, SAS, stay a student. And, and my staff knows that. Um, and it's, I, I just believe it at my heart and soul. Uh, another reason why I still love martial arts as much as I do is because I am a student. I take lessons every single week. <clears throat> and I, my, I think my head would explode if I didn't because... Let, let me ask you a question because yes, you, you, like I, you are connected to, and, and we haven't even really gotten here, but uh, for, you know, there's some folks out there who don't know the, the associations you've had to some... I mean, truly the best of the best of the best martial artists globally. How many of them do you know that aren't finding new things to undertake? How many of the best martial artists do you know that aren't, oh, I'm going to go cross train in this? Um, to the people that I admire, zero. <laughs> yeah. 
there yeah. there aren't a whole heck of a lot and right you know one one of the the people that i'm so for, fortunate enough to to know and get to train with on occasion is bill wallace and yep. you know i've watched that man try new things and continually challenge himself yep. and you know most people would put him you know up right i'm not, I'm not gonna score it in any way but when I think about these other people, like the, the people that I look up to, the people that I see making the most impact, whether in or out of competition in business, they're all continuing to learn and they're all willing to accept that, hey, there are things here I don't know. There are things I'm not good at. Right. Well, let me go get better at those. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill Wallace um, just received a lifetime achievement award the first you ever had, you from, had the chance to, to from be involved Team Paul in that, Mitchell. Saw, yeah yeah and we uh he is the first ever in our 37 year history where we made him an honorary lifetime team member we've never done that in 37 years um mm. uh and who got it bill wallace because are you kidding me i mean if there is anybody that uh, you know deserves that level of accolade oh my goodness I, I you know so many of us uh owe him and the people that came before us so much you know because we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if it wasn't for him uh and you know when you you know, he'll laugh it off and he'll joke it off. And, you know, he's he's a very humble and sometimes mm -hmm. self-deprecating. But, uh, you know, I, I hope in his heart at night, uh, he and so many others, I hope they allow themselves to feel the impact and the love and the support and the appreciation we all have for him. You know, uh, he's a pretty so special too. individual. Yeah. Absolutely. So this might be a good time for us to start to, to close. And I, and I don't, I normally don't call that much attention to it, but the reason I'm doing it now is because I think we have to have you back. I think we need to, and, and we'll find a way to do this. We'll, we'll, we'll make Roman schedules and, and such, not, not as a part two. Well, I know all. August 20th at 11 is available. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, um, you know, honestly, Andrew will, 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 will hear this before, for far before there. So, but I, I want to talk about at some point your, your involvement in competitive martial arts as, you know, because of your involvement with team Paul Mitchell and sure. the, just because I think there are lessons in there that everyone would benefit mm -hmm. from hearing. Sure. Um, even if even if competition isn't where they want to go, anytime I get to talk to somebody who is tied in with the best in the world, there are things that we can learn. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. I I, <clears throat> I enjoy uh, and I admire uh, anybody that has devoted their life to a particular craft. Uh, I've I've said you know in the analogy, I'm not a fan of ballet <laughs> per se. But if I went to ballet, I would be swept away because I understand what those people did and how much they had to work their craft to be able to do what they do. And if I had the opportunity to listen to a lecture from somebody who was a, a master in ballet, um, I, I'd be in the front row seat, you know, taking notes because there's the commonalities that I know I would benefit from. So, yeah, I don't. I don't look at it as a, uh, as a competitive, you know, or, well, that's, I don't do that art or something like that. I, you know, I think, I think there's, there's plenty of commonalities that we can all glean from. Yeah. Completely agree. If I was watching, uh, ballet, I'm, I'm probably going to be looking at it as, as kicks and saying, all right, well, <laughs> that's, all right I, I think I'll bring that combo back to class. The students might enjoy that. Yeah, that could be fun. Chris, if people want to get a hold of you, you know, your school, your personal stuff, where, where would they go? Um, <clears throat> there's an actual uh, website, uh, chrisrappold.com, okay. uh, that 
you know, somebody can find some information about me. The name of our school is Personal Best Karate, so I'm sure if they Google that, they could find that. Um, yeah, either one of those would be great. Awesome. Uh, certainly uh, Facebook, you know. Yeah. On there. You're all over. I see you all over. <laughs> you're you're in, yeah. places. Uh, in places. To the audience, please, you know, go go check out those things, and, and I hope that you really take some of these lessons that we've talked about here today around goals and growth and discomfort to heart and take a look at your own lives and see where maybe are you not challenging yourself? You know, you, you probably don't have the capacity to challenge every aspect of your life at the same time, but you probably have the capacity to challenge yourself a little bit more than you are. And so don't be afraid to embrace that because what you want from life will require that. So mm -hmm. it, see, see the cause and effect there. And of course, make sure you check out the show notes, uh, all the stuff that Chris and I have talked about today. But now, Chris, I'm going to throw it to you. How do, how do we close? How do we wrap this episode? What do you want to tell everybody? Uh, I just, uh, you know, <clears throat> having the opportunity to do a, a second podcast with you today, I just, uh, I want to thank you for everything that you're doing for the martial art industry. I think having conversations like this elevates the awareness of the value and the benefits of what martial arts can do for people. I also think, you know, talking to people like, uh, you know, we did together, like people like Buzz Durkin and Dave Kovar, you know, Jeremy, you're really doing us a service because you're preserving martial art history because like we revere Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and, and those, those people, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, there's going to be the stories of these people that you're talking to. So you're creating a, you're creating a platform for in-depth conversation with people that we can all learn from. So the way that I would like to close, sir, is to give a nod to you and say thank you. 